Um, great. Well, welcome, uh, folks, uh, to the um, program on information justice and intellectual properties IP at the Supreme Court series. My name is Michael Carroll, and I am a faculty director of the program, along with my colleague, Christine Farley. We started the series in 2012, and since then, every time the Supreme Court has taken an IP case or a closely related technology case, we invite counsel of record uh, to and, and counsel for various uh, friends of the court to come tell us about what happened at the oral argument and also explain the underlying merits of the case. And that's what we're going to do now. So I'm, I'm delighted to introduce um, uh, in the order of appearance. Um, so Scott Allen Burroughs is a partner at Doniger and Burroughs um, and he's counsel for the petitioner in this case. Um, he's handled over a thousand art and business law disputes and um, uh, involving fashion, art, photography, scripted reality programming, music, accessories, um, and all things copyright. <laughs> and um, um, so we'll be hearing more from him shortly. Uh, Radha Pathak is a partner at Stris and Maher, um, and she is counsel for the respondent in this case and represents clients in high stakes matters and high impact pro, pro bono case. Uh, she's litigated before the Supreme Court since 2005 and has been a core team member on almost all, all of the firm's uh, Supreme Court merit cases and also has litigated complex uh, procedural issues in federal district and appellate courts. Um, we are pleased to welcome back to WCL our uh, alum, Nancy Mertzell, who is the founder uh, of Mertzell Law. Uh, she is counsel of record for on the brief for the um, American Intellectual Property Law Association. Um, she has 25 years of more than 25 years of experience protecting brands, products, content, and technology. Broad litigation experience includes numerous copyright and trademark and trade dress, uh, as well as um, trade secret disputes um, involving uh, technology cases um, and other cutting edge issues. Um, and then uh, Professor Tyler Ochoa, who full disclosure is a, a co-author on a copyright book with me. Um, is a professor of law at Santa Clara University. He's counsel of record on a brief uh, for the uh, intellectual property law, law professors in support of petitioner um, and is a well, long recognized expert in copyright law and, and rights of publicity. Um, he joined the Santa Clara faculty in 2003 and serves, served as the academic director of the High Tech uh, Law Institute from 2005 and 2006. Um, prior to join, becoming an, uh, a professor um, he, at, at Santa Clara, he was on the faculty at Whittier Law School um, and served as a clerk for uh, Cecil Poole of the Ninth, uh, on the Ninth Circuit. Um, and then, um, let me just check, and then uh, Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn Forstein is an associate at Robbins, Russell, Englert, uh, Orsic, and you're going to have to help me with this, Ut 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 Utrenier. <laughs> I'm, I'm butchered that. Interiner. Similar. Interiner. Similar there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, and welcome, Carolyn. We've had some of your uh, your colleagues uh, on this uh, program before. Uh, she's a trial and appellate litigator. Uh, before joining the firm in 2018, she served as a law clerk to um, Chief Judge Timothy Burgess uh, of the United States District Court for the District of Alaska and as a foreign law clerk to Justice Edward uh, Cameron of the Constitutional Court in South Africa. Um, all right, so that's our distinguished panel. Um, I'm gonna tell you just a few things about this case um, in order to uh, uh, get us set up. And then we're going to turn, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to the panel. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, so, um, the issue here is what happens when there's a mistake on an application for copyright registration um, and what the legal standard is when such a mistake appears. Um, and there may be some other issues. So as, as a, a former panelist said about the Google case when we weren't sure if they were going to decide Google versus Oracle on uh, the jury grounds as opposed to other grounds, you know, you come for the copyright, but you might stay for the Civ Pro. So we're not quite sure what we're going to get here. but. Um, the issue is uh, in an application for copyright registration, the applicant must uh, identify whether the work is published or not and the date of first publication. And publication, according to the statute, is the distribution of copies of a work um, 
uh, by sale or other transfer of ownership to, to the public. So in this case, we're dealing with fabric design. And a question is whether the, um, the wh whether they were published or when they were published rather. Um, now the application for publication, I'm sorry, for uh, copyright registration in this case involved 31 designs that were grouped together on a single application. That's a permitted practice under the Copyright Office rules um, if they can be recognized as self-contained uh, that are part of the same unit of publication. And I'm, I'm showing you the current version of the rule, the version in effect in 2011 was slightly different, but this same unit of publication language is the, is the critical uh, language that's gonna get discussed. Um, and, and so under, um, under uh, section 411B, uh, so the Copyright Office said, or the Copyright Act says that in order to file an action for infringement, if the, the work is United States work, uh, then a, a copyright registration must be made first. And the Supreme Court has uh, now said that what it means to make registration is to file your application and get an answer from the Copyright Office. Um, and when you file that application, um, what happens if there's a mistake? Um, so in 2008, in the Pro-IP Act, um, after a, a bunch of uh, years of case law that we're likely to hear about from the panel, uh, um, Congress amended the act to add section 411B1, which says a certificate of registration satisfies the requirements. That is, you can now file suit and get the benefits of attorney's fees um, and statutory damages under 412, uh, regardless of whether the certificate contains any inaccurate information. So we're gonna hear that phrase inaccurate information, unless the inaccurate information was included uh, on the application with knowledge that it was inaccurate. We're gonna hear a lot about intent and knowledge uh, and the inaccuracy of the information if known would have caused the, the register of copyrights uh, to refuse registration. And then in step two, if, if, this, if this is the problem, then the district court is supposed to ask the, the uh, copyright office if in fact they would have denied registration. Um, but in uh, the Ninth Circuit decided that, um, that the district court had erred uh, by not asking the copyright office for its opinion because in the Ninth Circuit's view, there was inaccurate information under step one and the inaccuracy was the type of, of the type that um, a, a district court reasonably should reach out to the court of appeal. I'm sorry, the copyright office. That didn't happen because the uh, petition for certiorari was filed and the Supreme Court granted it. So um, uh, instead, we're going to hear a lot more about um, uh, this. Now, um, the question presented, and this is also going to be the Civ Pro issue, is whether the question presented here in the petition is in fact what got litigated. And if, if, if those two changed, is there a problem under the rules of practice under, under the Supreme Court? But here the question is, did the Ninth Circuit make a mistake um, uh, and, and uh, create a circuit split um, when it's in the absence of indicia of fraud or material, uh, uh, material error? And I just uh, raised that this, these words are fraud or material error, but remember that um, section 411 is about, uh, re refers to knowledge. And so that's, that's gonna be one of the other issues. Uh, one last piece of law is um, the, the Copyright Office has an internal operating manual um, and under the version of that manual at the time that the application was filed, um, this is the sort of group registration for published works. Um, and what the, what the um, briefing shows is, or indicates is that of those 31 works, some of them were not, not published on the same, well, there's a, I guess there's a dispute about whether they were published on the same date, but some of them were reserved exclusively for some clients, others were made available in the showroom. Um, and so the, the uh, the assumption, I guess, for the purposes of this case is that it was an error to treat all of them as being part of uh, the same unit of publication. That was, that was a, another issue the Ninth Circuit decided that was offered to the court and the court did not 
take that as um, one of the issues. So we won't be deciding what a single unit of publication is, or, or the court won't be deciding that um, in, in this case. All right, um, so let me just stop sharing um, and get us started. So what I'm gonna do is ask um, uh, the, the attorney, our, our panelists to first briefly explain sort of a little bit more about their position on the merits. Um, and then we had an interesting argument and a lot of different, it's going to be a little hard to keep track of all the different issues, but we'll do our best. So Scott, why don't you get us started? And you, you filed the petition for certiorari. Uh, why? And what'd you argue? Sure. Thank you uh, first for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be part of this program uh, this evening. The, the petition that we filed was brought because the Ninth Circuit in this case decided to depart from decades and decades of consistent case law in which it held Though you know maybe via a different route, it held in each case that a, a good faith mistake in a copyright registration is not going to invalidate that registration. That's been the law, as I mentioned, for decades. I've personally been involved in numerous appeals in which the issue was raised and in which the Ninth Circuit uniformly said, if a, a mistake is uh, included on a application or registration and it's unknowing, it's in good faith, it's not made with an intent to defraud, there's a number of different ways the court gets there. But at the end of the day, they, they look at the information, and if that information was not made with knowledge that it was false, they approve the registration or they allow the applicant to be part of the 411 safe harbor. The Ninth Circuit in, in this case waded into this you know, decades of precedent and for the first time imported this ignorance of the law exception and said, look, even though you may be a, a poet or an author or a fashion designer, we're going to charge you with knowledge of everything in the CFR. And the CFR, for any of you that have looked at it, it's thousands of pages long and it has numerous examples and numerous pieces of information that are, that are very complex. Something interesting that transpired during the hearing today is that the, you know, the courts and the people presenting to the court weren't able to arrive at a, a uniform definition of what publication even means. So if the people at the top of, of, of the profession who are arguing this and the highest court of the land can't decide, it's really uh, difficult to hold a, a fashion designer to that standard. And the, the statute at issue, the Pro-IP Act, right, is a, assumed to embrace all these decades of, um, of case law that said that you know, good faith mistakes won't invalidate. The Ninth Circuit looked at the language and said, no, we think the Pro-IP Act makes it easier for infringers to evade liability we're going to find that this importation of the uh, ignorance of the law exception is going to bring copyright holders outside of the Pro-IP Act protections. So you know, in, the, in this context today, there was a lot of conversation about what is knowledge, what is a knowing inaccuracy. And our position, as it has always been, is that a knowing inaccuracy is a, a statement that's false on the facts, false on the law, and false on the application of the law. There was a great um, analogy by Justice Breyer about spotting a bird. And you, know, you may know a fact about that bird, but you may have the typology wrong. You may you know, refer to it by the, the, the wrong type or the wrong name. And that's similar to this situation. When you're looking at what a unit of publication is, you may know certain facts relating to that publication. You may know certain facts about your business. But if you're not uh, cognizant of how the law applies to it, and if you apply the law, to those facts in a way that is inaccurate, that's the exact type of registration issue that's supposed to be within the safe harbor. And this whole notion that there should be some sort of constructive knowledge or some sort of um, uh, supposition that uh, copyright applicants should know the law when, when registering, um, it, it doesn't stand up when you look at the text because every aspect of the copyright registration, everything that an applicant includes in that application when registering has a legal component, right? It, would you uh, identify the author? Is it a work of joint authorship? What does, it, you know, what does it take from a creative standpoint to justify someone being an author? Is it a derivative work? Is it a work for hire? All of these questions have legal components. And for decades, all of these uh, sections in the copyright office have uh, withheld heirs, or withstood heirs. So people have pointed out, or copyright infringers have pointed out that people have uh, not designated something a derivative work when they should have or vice versa, that the wrong author or the wrong claimant is named in the application. And courts consistently say the, the applicant is not chargeable with the law. They simply made a mistake. The discussion 
for the most part today, you know, followed that track. You know, what does it, what does knowledge mean? Does knowledge uh, under the Pro-IP Act mean knowledge of the law and the facts and how to apply the law correctly to the facts? You know, our position is, of, of course not. You know, one of the justices adroitly noted that you can't have, you can't require applicants to hire a big law firm every time you file an application to make sure your legal bases are covered. Uh, so, you know, the argument uh, today focused on what, what is knowledge. And, you know, we believe that the positions that we took during uh, our presentation, and we believe the position taken by the government during its presentation, you know, were consistent and compelling. And that's to have a knowing inaccuracy. You have to know the facts, you have to know the law, and you have to, uh, with knowledge, apply the law to the facts inaccurately. There's no evidence of that at the uh, at the, either the district court during the trial at which H and M was found to be a willful infringer, um, and the record and appeal really didn't have any evidence in that regard either, which is important here because the uh, as we know when we talk about copyright registrations there is a presumption of validity, and it's the infringer that bears the burden of presenting evidence to invalidate. Here there either was no evidence or there was some inconclusive evidence as to facts and facts only. There was nothing as to any of these other issues. And on that basis, we argue that the uh, Ninth Circuit should be reversed. Great, um, thank you. And so Rada, you, H&M uh, takes a different view, why? So I think I'm gonna start in a, take a sort of slightly different order than um, Scott just did. We have a number of disagreements about the question presented and that actually, you know, we have disagreements about exactly what the Ninth Circuit decided, and that actually kind of is part of what you call what you called the Civ Pro question, um, the sort of you know practice before, before the Supreme Court piece of the case. But so I'll kind of talk about the merits um, briefly, and by merits, what I mean is, well, you know, how should the word knowledge in 411b be interpreted? And our position is that um, there's sort of two questions that the court can be asking. There's a question about what the object of knowledge should be and what the scope of the knowledge should be. What I mean by object of knowledge is, well, what does um, an applicant have to have knowledge of? Um, our view is that the court needs to utilize the longstanding, excuse me, mm, the longstanding interpretive principle, the longstanding interpretive principle that ignorance of the law is no defense um, and that's, you know, as important as any other. And we think that that pushes back against the idea that here you have to have knowledge of both the law and the facts. Um, and I think that the work that the, in, the word information is doing is not quite right, because if you look at cases like McFadden, um, there the object of knowledge is something that encompasses both law and facts. Um, in exactly the same way that information can encompass both law and facts. And yet the court in McFadden decided that uh, a person need not, uh, ignorance of the law doesn't excuse knowledge. And so to here, we think that, you know, Congress was obviously legislating against a backdrop of an interpretive principle. And so when it talks about having knowledge of information, it's referring to knowledge of factual information rather than the legal significance of those facts. So that's kind of on the object question. Um, on the scope question, our position is that the word knowledge is a, is a word that requires interpretation. It's not a word that has an ordinary meaning that is uncontroversial. Um, it can encompass actual knowledge, or it, it can also encompass some kind of imputed knowledge. And the court has to decide based on context, in almost every instance, what the word knowledge means. When the word knowledge is standing alone, our starting point is that it because it can include either actual or constructive, we can't just start from the position that it must mean actual. And if you look at other provisions in the Copyright Act, as well as other statutes, you see that when Congress intended to specify actual knowledge, it uses those words, or the context shows that the court, meant, that Congress rather um, meant to require actual knowledge as opposed to actual or imputed knowledge. So we think on sort of both of those axes, the, that's kind of how the court, the way the court should be interpreting the meaning of the word knowledge is that it requires knowledge of the legal significance of facts in addition to requiring knowledge of facts. And also that the knowledge can be um, 
I'm sorry that it, the the sorry that not that it doesn't require knowledge of the legal significance of facts. You should ignore that. I um, mean, it only requires the knowledge of the facts, and also that the knowledge can be either actual or imputed. So you know that's kind of our holistic position on how the statute should be interpreted. One of the things that didn't you know necessarily come out in the argument today though is that we actually you know we argued in our brief that even if the court um, rejected the idea that the object of the knowledge, um, you know, was facts as opposed to facts and law, then it, we, it could nonetheless affirm, even if it adopted the rule that um, knowledge could be actual as well as constructive. So that's sort of our take on the meaning of the word knowledge. And there's a lot that's going on in the case in addition to what I just outlined. And I think in particular, um, and I don't know if this is the right time or if we should come back to it later, but in particular, I think we have a pretty serious disagreement about what the Ninth Circuit did here, um, whether it did in fact depart um, in the way that, that Scott um, said that it did, or whether it was at least can be fairly read to be holding that here Unicolors actually had actual knowledge um, that publication did not occur on January 15th of all of the designs in the application that are, that are covered by the application. And you know, because of that, this case doesn't really implicate whether a good faith of mistake of law um, should trigger referral to the Copyright Office or not. So I'll sort of just flag that for now and, and we can talk about it more or you know, now or later. Yeah, no, good. And, and just, I, I'm a little worried. I've got a bunch of my students in the room and, and <laughs> we're talking at a very abstract level. Uh, it, it just so knowledge of fact in this case would be the fact the facts that the works were made available to the public, which is the legally significant fact, right? And then, and there, there are the two issues about what's the date of publication, right? Do, do you know the fact that, on which that date? And then do you know, then there was another issue about the group registration and what counts as a single unit of publication. Yeah, it, yeah I think there were, you know, the, the government's brief outlines two potential inaccuracies on the registration and in, 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 in the application. Um, and the two potential inaccuracies, and you know, H&M um, has always alleged that there was actual knowledge of, of you know, in particular, we focused on one, one of these two inaccuracies, but um, the government kind of lays it out in their brief and says, there's an inaccuracy, the, the application is inaccurate because in one way, which is that the first way is that it identifies all 31 of these designs as having been published on January 15th, and that's inaccurate because there is evidence that all 31 designs were not put into a showroom on January 15th. Um, rather, some of them were held back and not put into the showroom on January 15th. So that's one inaccuracy. A different, and that's inaccurate, it, that publication date is inaccurate. Um, and I'll just, you know, kind of preview that, you know, our, our position is that that Unicolors didn't argue that it had a mistaken um, understanding of law there. The second inaccuracy is whether the designs were sufficiently to get, you know, published together you know, in a way that's different than date, you know, whether, what it means to be bundled. Um, that, there's that second inaccuracy. And you know, that, that's not an inaccuracy that, that, that H&M was necessarily um, pressing in the same way as the first. It, and so, and that's a more complex, I think, legal question as to whether, you know, what the bundling requirement is. Right, great. Um, all right, so Nancy, uh, you, wrote a, you wrote for the AIPLA and, and why, and what's the position that they're taking in this case? Oh, thank you, Professor Carroll. It's great to be back at my alma mater doing this again. Um, so, AIPLA's amicus brief was a little bit different than most of the other um, briefs in the case because we did not really um, take a position on the type of knowledge or the um, uh, whether fraud is required, you know, the intent requirement. We didn't specifically argue you have to have Center, mens rea, intent. And we didn't really argue um, how to interpret that. What AIPLA did is we took a narrower position, which was basically getting into this question about mistakes of law and mistakes of fact and saying, 
that when uh, you look at section 411B, if you have a mistake of law, which our brief calls it a mischaracterization of the legal status of the facts. So if you have that, we argued that um, you're not gonna get, have a problem with section 411B. And um, we talked a lot about the complexities of copyright law, which so many of the briefs did. You know, as people have already said today, copyright applications are not simple recitations of fact. Who is the author? Who, what is, when was it published? Was it published? Where was it first published? Um, is it a derivative work? Is it a work for hire? All these questions, you know, everyone thinks, oh, I want to file my copyright application. I'm take 10 minutes. I'll fill out the form. And I'm always like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's back up. Who created it? Was it a work for hire? Um, so with, with that, we argued that the Copyright Act is, is almost as complicated um, or is it's sufficiently complicated that it should be viewed like the tax code because there's a um, Supreme Court case that says that when you have a tax code violation and you, talk, you have to have a, a knowledge of the law there, um, it's going to be a more lenient standard because the law is so complicated. Um, so that's what we argued. Um, we also argued that the district court should use the discretion that it inherently possesses to manage its caseload and to consider the question of whether the allegation by the defendant that this inaccurate information was knowingly included was that allegation sufficiently plausible? Um, getting into the Civ Pro side of the case, let's think about Iqbal and Twombly, because the statute says whenever an, an, an allegation is raised, basically. So, you know, do judges have to reflexively refer something to the Copyright Office every time a defendant says, oh, there's an inaccuracy and it was knowingly included? And we, devoted a section of our brief to saying, no, they don't have to do that. They can decide whether it was plausible. Maybe it can be done on papers. Maybe you need a hearing. Uh, we'll leave that to the district court, but we shouldn't just refer things automatically to the copyright office. Um, I, you know, I found the discussion um, fascinating today. The bird analogy was excellent, um, but there were all these cases discussed about uh, like criminal cases and ERISA cases where, you know, did you know it was a controlled substance, for example? You knew you had the, let's say, cocaine. Did you know it was um, a controlled substance under the Controlled Substance Act? Act That's one of them. Um, and th those cases are really interesting. There was a very lively discussion between Justice Kavanaugh and Peter Stris for H&M arguing about uh, those types of cases. And I, and I think that you know, the court may get into that. I think that they're going to look at the type of knowledge and, and parse the statute. Um, so, you know, uh, that's that's basically the brief that we wrote and the Great. position that we took. Yeah, no, and, and teeing up where Tyler's going, you're, there's sort of two different branches of case law that are relevant here. One is, is sort of Congress chose the word knowledge, and Congress has chosen that word in lots of other contexts. So there are a lot of analogies um, uh, about that. The other is that Congress legislated against a background of, of, of uh, copyright case law on this. And I know, Tyler, that was uh, something you were particularly interested in and the, the parties differ in their view about that case law. Just a quick note for my students, when I start teaching contracts and all the students come in and they want the answer, I say, look, that's not your goal. Your goal is, this is all about arguments, not answers, because your job as the lawyer is to make arguments. And you know when you've got law professors on both sides that this is an arguments, not answers question. So Tyler, take it away. Um, so uh, the purpose of our brief was sort of to place this question in its historical context. So the first part of our brief just pointed out that ever since the 1909 Act was passed, uh, Congress has sort of consistently reduced the importance of formalities in uh, copyright and in copyright registration, right? So it used to be that you had to jump through all of these hoops. You had to register before the uh, work was published, 
And then when you published, you had to publish with proper copyright notice. You had to deposit copies. And if you did any one of these things wrong, your copyright was invalidated. And over the past two centuries, Congress has slowly chipped away at all of those things and say, yes, we're still going to require those things. Uh, in the case of notice, copyright notice is no longer even required. Uh, but it's not going to invalidate your copyright if you do this. So the entire trend has, make in, has made compliance with these type of formalities less important through, through the centuries. And when we look at this context specifically in terms of registration, I think the legislative history is very clear. There was a doctrine called fraud on the copyright office and it arose by negative implication because courts have said, well, if you made an error on your registration, that's okay. We're not going to uh, invalidate your registration just because you made an error so long as it was an inadvertent mistake of some kind. And uh, so as long as there was no fraud, you weren't trying to deceive anybody, uh, we're going to let the registration stand. And so district courts took the, that case law and they said, well, the opposite must be that if there is fraud, if there is some sort of intent to deceive the copyright office, then a registration should be invalidated. And when, uh, when this section of the Copyright Act was passed, Section 411B, was enacted in 2008, um, they referred to the doctrine of fraud on the Copyright Office. And I think it's clear that people thought that, that they were codifying that and that an intentional misrepresentation was the equivalent of fraud. So if we were looking at that legislative history, I think the answer here is pretty clear. And I think the only thing that makes the answer unclear is because you've got a lot of judges who, are, who say, well, we, we're not gonna look at the legislative history. We're only going to look at the language of the statute. And if you read the language of the statute without that context, you could come to a different answer. But if you read it in that context, it strikes me that you're gonna say, okay, inadvertent errors don't, don't matter here. And the inadvertent error was, well, what does it mean to be published? And there's just tons of case law on what publication means in different contexts. And because publication used to be super important, there's lots of case law that allows you to bend the concept of publication. Things that you might have said were published where copies were distributed, no, that didn't count. That was only a limited publication under this case law. So there's lots of case law differing on what publication means in different contexts. And so when they say, well, do we know whether this was published or not? Well, we know that it was placed in a showroom and then made available to customers, um, or maybe it wasn't placed in a showroom, but it was made available to customers on the same date. Is that a publication or not? And it strikes me that the Ninth Circuit is essentially saying, well, you should have known what a publication means and should have known constructive knowledge is not what was intended here, right? Congress used the word knowledge. I think they meant actual knowledge, not should have known. And then our final point we made was, we just went through this in the Patent Act, right? With the Federal Circuit had taken a, a, a doctrine fraud on the patent office and they had watered it down so that it, instead of knowledge that something was inaccurate, they said, well, you knew or should have known it was inaccurate. And it made it super easy to claim that there was fraud on the patent office. And it led to all sorts of collateral litigation. It was a complete nightmare. And the notion that Congress wanted to do the same thing in copyright law by watering down the standard and making it a new or should have known standard strikes me as just completely nuts. Uh, it was chaotic in patent law. Federal Circuit finally fixed it by saying, no, it's got to be actual knowledge of something that's material. And it strikes me that's what Congress wanted to do with copyright law as well. Great. Thank you. And then, Carolyn, so you, you represent uh, uh, professors who take a different view. Uh, why? We do. Um, so represent a different group of 12 professors of copyright law. 
And at the outset I should say, this group of professors actually did not take a position on whether or not knowledge within 411B referred to actual or constructive knowledge. Um, so the position is that sort of the textual, the text is the text, uh, the, te the statute uses the term knowledge and sort of that's where the analysis should stop with respect to the fraud versus knowledge debate. But our group of professors did not take a position on sort of the, ex the definition of knowledge within the statute. Instead, what our group of professors chose to focus on was a policy issue, um, which is essentially the problem posed by copyright trolls. So just some sort of brief background on copyright trolling as a problem. Uh, the term gets thrown around a lot, but the idea of a copyright troll would be a copyright holder who holds or acquires a copyright for an opportunistic purpose, um, not sort of with the goal of protecting expression, but instead for the goal of extracting a payment through litigation. So this can happen in a couple of different ways. Um, one might be a person, uh, either an individual or an entity who acquires a wide range of copyrights that are fairly thin, that cover you know, a design that has a lot of common elements but they go ahead and register a copyright in them and then search for an individual who's arguably infringed that copyright and bring a lawsuit. Alternatively, it could be a person who holds a copyright in a piece of media um, something that's on the internet and that's used by a ton of users and they could bring a lawsuit against a number of unknown John Doe defendants and then seek to discover those defendants through litigation. And either way, sort of the goal or the issue behind copyright trolling is that a troll is effectively using the threat of litigation and the costs involved in defending oneself from a copyright suit as a way of extracting settlement payments. Um, as we noted in our amicus brief, there have been a number of empirical studies and also judicial decisions that recognize this problem. Uh, one empirical study from 2014 to 2016 estimated that 50% of the federal copyright docket was in fact copyright troll lawsuits. And I think at oral argument today, we saw several different justices express concern over the problem posed by copyright trolling. So the purpose of the brief that we wrote was to point out the ways in which an overly permissive registration system including one in which 411B only applies in cases of fraud and where there's actual intent to deceive, um, could in fact uh, enable copyright trolls. So this can happen in, again, a couple of different ways. Um, one might be that the model of copyright trolling is typically built on speed and sort of prioritizing speed and breadth over accuracy in a registration. And as I think uh, Nancy pointed out earlier, registrations can be complicated. So the idea um, behind a registration system that's actually enforced would be that uh, copyright trolls might be deterred from filing sort of a wide range of copyrights if in fact they had to sort of put more care and thought into what went into their applications. Um, the second and sort of more critical point I think is that enforcing registration requirements leads to greater accuracy, which also empowers defendants to push back. And I think the best example of this might be the prior works disclosure requirement in a registration under which um, a copyright claimant has to identify pre-existing work that their work is based on or incorporates. And so if you're a defendant who's been served with a copyright lawsuit and you can look at the registration and see that a prior work is listed and you realize that say your own work is based on that same prior work, then you have a defense to that copyright lawsuit. Uh, so the purpose of the brief was sort of to point out both the prevalence of copyright trolling and the ways in which uh, in, in registration system that both while allowing for, you know, people to easily register copyrights, the one that's also where registration requirements can in fact be enforced uh, has benefits for sort of maintaining the integrity of the copyright system more broadly. Um, and one last thing I would say about that is that we saw today at oral argument, I think, concern about policy arguments on both sides of the balance. So there's a concern about copyright trolls. There's also certainly a concern about, you know, innocent applicants and artists and poets and people that don't have sort of access to lawyers or tons of time to spend on registration, still ensuring that they have access to the copyright system. Um, so I think you have seen a lot of sort of contravailing policy concerns. And one additional point that we pointed out in our brief is that 411B as a second subsection, so in 411B1B, there's a materiality provision, which says that an error, um, the inaccuracy of the information, if known, would have caused the register of copyrights to refuse registration. So I think one additional point here would be that there's an additional backstop, you know, an artist who applies for copyright registration and makes a small innocent error uh, can receive a declaration from the register of copyrights that that error was in fact immaterial and that the registration is still valid. Great, thanks. Um, 
Okay, so let's let's find out what happened today in court. Um, and it, uh, the court has changed the way arguments work in response to a law review articles that said that the women on the court are interrupted by both their co male colleagues and sometimes counsel. So we now get the sort of sequenced questions that we got during uh, lockdown. Um, and I was surprised when Justice Breyer took a pass on his first turn because he's always active in copyright cases. But Scott, how'd you do it? What what were your, you know, maybe top two takeaways from the argument? Yeah, so the argument uh, went, for the most part, uh, as expected, the questions did really, they kind of cut through some of these sort of frivolous issues like copyright trolling and, and things that didn't have to do with the actual interpretation of the statute and really looked at, you know, what does the language say? What is the policy behind the language and how should it have been applied here? And, you know, the questions when they drilled down on that, they seem to evince, you know, results that were consistent with, with our position, which is there, you can't import this uh, knowledge of the law requirement into a statute that is, that was promulgated against this background of, of decades of cases that said that an inadvertent error is not going to invalidate. And there was even a period uh, during the argument where H&M's counsel conceded that you know, there was some ambiguity in the statute. And we know when there's ambiguity in a statute that we look at it as embracing the cases that have come before it on the topic. And here, the cases, though they take different paths, they've all arrived at the same result, which is that you can't invalidate a, a copyright registration without a, a knowing inaccuracy. And there was this further wrinkle that was uh, presented during the government's uh, time which was that one of the, uh, the, the putative errors, you know, the primary putative error that the Ninth Circuit found uh, with the h and I'm sorry, with the Unicolors registration was that it, uh, the works were not bundled when they, when they were registered. The problem with that is that this registration was submitted in 2011 and the bundling requirement wasn't included in the CFRs until 2014. So not only did the Ninth Circuit uh, you know, import a, a knowledge of the law is, or, sorry, lack of knowledge of the law is no excuse defense, but it also imported a, you, you need to know what the law is going to be in the future when you register. And as I mentioned before, you know, the CFR is thousands of pages long and these people that are filling them out are creating arts and running their business and, and doing things that don't allow them to, you know, follow closely everything in the current version of this CFR and what may be in a, a future iteration. So, you know, it was, um, it was striking when looking at the briefs, how much time that H&M uh, &M and their Amici spent on these ancillary issues um, and trolling, you know, for one. And I think the, the courts uh, dispensed with that um, pretty readily and said, look, who knows better how to fill out a copyright registration than a so-called troll, somebody who's always filing registrations and suing people. Um, and, you know, of course, in this case, there's no evidence that uh, you know, Unicolors is a troll. All evidence indicated they're a design studio in Los Angeles with multiple designers and business. They're practicing, you know, what in patent law. And we did have that situation that we always, you know, uh, or we seem to always see in copyright cases where um, copyright issues are referred to as patent or trademark issues. But we did have a, a reference to, to patent trolling today. And as we all know, patent trolling only exists when you have a non-practicing entity suing people. There's no evidence that Unicolors ever did that. There's no evidence that any of these other folks, uh, you know, that have brought cases or more than one case in the past have done that. And, you know, the Supreme Court, I think, parried that fantastically during oral argument and really focused in on, on what's important here. And that's the, the language of the statute. You know, what does 411 say? And then what's the policy behind it? Uh, you know, there was a question at one point uh, that basically uh, went along the lines of, why would anybody file a, a registration with a mistake? What's the benefit, right? Maybe you save a couple of bucks, but nobody would go through all of that to save a couple of bucks. Nobody's making false uh, you know, statements in their, in their registration to save a couple of bucks. It simply, it doesn't make any sense. And you could uh, feel that you know, in the air and the tenor of the questioning today. There's... Um, you know, there's also this, uh, and I don't want to take up, up too much time, but, you know, there's also this issue of the, the time at which the, uh, the defendant or the, the infringer, H&M here, raised the, this issue of, you know, problem with the registration. I see that in one of the questions, 
And that came to bear on the, uh, on the discussion today because the, the record doesn't have a whole lot about this invalidation issue because H&M didn't really press this argument to trial. They didn't really believe in it. It wasn't until after they'd already been adjudged a willful infringer, they had a unanimous jury verdict against them that they said, oh wait, it looks like Unicolors may have made a mistake on this registration 10 years ago. And you know, because of that, it, it really raises this problem of you know, if a 411 challenge is available to an infringer, when do they have to make it? Can they do what H&M did here and raise it you know, after they'd already lost on everything else? You know, that uh, context was the context in which you know, the questioning today on these issues relating to the record and you know, what was shown in terms of knowledge in any of its forms um, you know, was, a, uh, was a, an interesting component of the conversation. Uh, um, so, Rada, what I mean, and on that point, I guess uh, H&M's brief uh, tells a different story about the timing. But, but Rada, if I can focus you on the on the argument in particular, you know, top two takeaways, sort of what what surprised you most, or what did you find most notable? Well, you know, I'm I'm not sure that anything was particularly surprising. I think this was a hard, you know, I'll, I'll just speak for my just myself for a moment, I think this was actually a hard argument to predict the direction that we prepared for a lot of potential directions and, you know, where the court was going to have interest isn't something that I think, you know, maybe Scott, Scott sounds like he knew exactly where it was going to go. Um, you know, and just candidly, I've been doing this a long time and, and I, I wasn't sure where the court was going to go. So what I thought was notable, um, I agree with Scott, by the way, that the court had questions about the text, they had questions about the purpose. Those, there are fewer of those um, than one might have expected, um, you know, um, but certainly there were questions along those lines. And so I guess what I'll add is that what was notable is that the court did have questions about the shift in the question presented between the petition and the reply. And so, you know, they, they showed some interest in um, what you could, I think, narrowly understand as a, as a dig argument to, to dismiss as improvidently granted, but I think actually is potentially a more robust point, um, again, about like what is the scope of what exactly the Ninth Circuit decided and what was the record below? Um, you know, I think had the petition been more like the reply at the at the cert at the petition stage, then I think that, um, you know, you'd be you'd have seen very different vehicle arguments, kind of vehicle arguments that ended up sneaking into, you know, not sneaking into, but be, we ended up having to put into essentially the, the merits we've on some level, but not not for the purpose of, of making an argument about vehicle, but, but rather to illustrate why it would be somewhat problematic for the court at this point in time to go beyond the question that was originally presented, which is, was there, it, did Congress intend for the word knowledge to mean intent? Nobody at this point is really defending that it did. Um, one, and the Ninth Circuit got that right. And once the court, uh, you know, we think the court really shouldn't be doing much more than that. Um, and it, you know, all of these kind of complexities about what the word knowledge means, you know, only come into play once you accept that it's appropriate for the court to reach beyond what we think was the question presented and fairly included in the question presented. Great. So there's a discussion so, of that. So we've got 10 minutes. So Nancy, Tyler, and Carolyn, let's keep it brief. But Nancy, what what most what was most striking about the argument? I was surprised that the court spent as much time as it did on the argument of, or the issue of the question presented. I, I saw that in the briefing and um, I didn't view it as really a merits argument. I viewed it as more of um, a criticism because we are, we're all here because of the Ninth Circuit's decision. You know, they, they basically said that this, this innocent mistake um, can invalidate the registration and the repercussions of that, which we haven't talked about that much today, are pretty substantial though, in terms of losing statutory damages, um, losing attorney's fees, potentially a statute of limitations problem if you don't find out in time. Um, and so, you know, those things are litigation privileges, they're very substantial. Um, the other thing was, I was surprised about the um, amount of time on copyright trolling or patent trolling, which was inaccurately referred to as, because, um, you know, for me, the, the copyright troll thing is a bit of a red herring. I don't think that um, the purpose of section 411B was to deal with copyright trolls. 
you know, the courts have lots of resources available to do that, and they've done so. Um, we've all been following, I'm sure, the, the saga of uh, Mr. Leibowitz. And so to me, that's not what this case is about. Great, thanks. Tyler, how about you? Um, so I can understand why the court thinks there was a bit of a, a dodge in the question presented here, uh, because the real problem is not, is it fraud versus not, is it knowledge? The real problem is, is it knowledge of facts or is it knowledge of the law? And that's the thing that the Ninth Circuit got wrong. And so the way the question was presented, they presented it in such a way that there was a very clear circuit split. Um, and you know, when you start digging down into it, the circuit split is still there, but it's really on a different issue, right? Is it knowledge of facts or is it knowledge of the law? Um, but, you know, the government is, is on the side of vacating and remanding in this case. Uh, and I think that's probably the, the, the proper way to go here is to make it clear, okay, what sort of knowledge is required here? Send it back for the Ninth Circuit to reconsider those, that and really take a hard look at, at the facts as they were done. But what I find unusual is that, you know, nobody's looking at the fact this was intended to make it harder to invalidate registrations, right? There was this whole whimsicality case where a second circuit found there was fraud and the copyright office had to go in and say, no, we don't think this was fraud. This was our practice. Um, and in the wake of that, they passed this statute trying to codify fraud on the copyright office. And they're like, well, make sure you ask the copyright office what it thinks before you invalidate anything, right? And people are trying to turn that on that head and saying, no, this was intended to make it harder to, uh, I mean, easier to invalidate registrations. No, it was intended to make it harder to invalidate registrations. Right, and but, but to be clear, the Ninth Circuit wanted to ask the copyright office and to Nancy's point, what's the what's the standard before it's you should ask is not wasn't fully litigated. And Carolyn, sorry, but uh, wh what were your uh, what was your top takeaway? Well, I think I would echo my fellow panelists in saying it was striking to me that there were a number of questions about the question presented and the possibility of um, a dismissal as improvidently granted. And I think the other things I would point out would just be that uh, I think you saw through some of the hypotheticals and the questions that there is sort of grappling with the real world consequences of what these interpretations would do and that it can be a bit slippery to figure out exactly how the different proposed standards by the parties would operate in practice. Um, and sort of as a final thing, and this might only be striking to us since we thought about it in writing our brief uh, and understandable since it wasn't truly a part of uh, the framing of the case, but was sort of the significance of the materiality provision in 411B just sort of mostly went unmentioned and unquestioned by the court. Right. Um, yeah, and just for the students in, in the room, the, a couple of terms you just heard that, so a vehicle is normally discussed as a good case for the Supreme Court to decide because it's a, a case that uh, presents a clear question of law that is either the subject of a split decision among the circuit courts of appeal or has some reason. And, and I think one of the, the issues that you're hearing about the question presented as opposed to the, this knowledge question is whether this case actually is the vehicle they thought that it was when they granted cert. Um, and then one thing that can happen if the court gets into a case and realizes this is more factually complicated than we thought is it can dismiss the case as improvidently granted and or uh, and vacate the decision below and remand for a reconsideration, which is what the government was uh, suggesting. So to the students who want an answer, we might the answer might be you have to wait. <laughs> Just that's a <laughs> warning. Um, so we only had one question in the Q&A, which I think was uh, largely answered, but if anyone uh, wants to add any anything else, how about the, how about the general, you know, uh, argument in the time that we're in? Like, was there anything about the way the justices behaved in this new format that was in any way surprising, sort of? I, I thought Breyer taking a pass on the first 
round was a surprise, but I don't know if anyone else had any observations along those lines. No, not, not along those lines, though I think this issue of the, the QP and whether it shifted a bit was a function uh, to some degree of the position that um, H&M took in their papers, was, uh, which was that we initially made a, a, uh, an indication that we were pushing an intent to defraud standard, which would align more with Roberts v. Gordy, the 11th Circuit case that uh, creates the circuit split. But it, when uh, it was uh, indicated both in our reply brief and then today at oral argument, uh, that the actual uh, language was indicia of fraud. Yeah, I think that it, it made sense to everyone that, you know, what's a, a, you know, probably the primary indicator of fraud, and that's making a know, knowing misstatement to another with the hope that they rely upon it. So I, I know there was some time spent on it, but at the end of the day, it didn't seem like it was all that important. Somebody just asked whether um, anyone thinks Justice Thomas will write a separate opinion on the dig issue, you know, if, if majority don't agree with him. And I personally would be, I don't think that he would necessarily go there. I think probably if, you know, that's something that they'll resolve. Yeah, that would be surprising. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the copyright cases that have been decided recently, um, you see Justice Breyer has been very consistent sort of been sort of a consistent advocate of the public domain. And you had a bunch of cases that were seven to two with Breyer dissenting. It looks to me, based on the questioning here, that Breyer is very much on the side of the petitioner in this case, uh, which would place him on the side of the copyright owner. Uh, we don't usually see him there, but uh, it, it strikes me that his, his bird example was very much uh, in line with what the petitioner would like to see happen here. Yeah, we much prefer discussion of a discussion of birds as opposed to shovels. I think uh, that's it. <laughs> preferable. Yeah, and and on that, I mean, I I think you're right on the substance of his copyright positions, but he's also a real advocate for legislative history, and um, uh, and to the extent then that he he agrees with your reading of that history, that would that would help explain that. So we are actually coming to time. Let me see, there was one other question that just got added. Um, oh, yes, Brianna. So yes, uh, it's a good question. Congress anticipated the problem that you raise. And if the Copyright Office refuses registration, you're still allowed to go to federal court. You just don't get the presumption of validity um, because you should have your day in court to, to litigate that question. But the court said you need to wait for the Copyright Office's answer before you can file that lawsuit, whatever that answer is. Um, so we're at six. I want to uh, ask everyone to please applaud virtually for our panelists. Uh, it was a rich discussion. I'm, I'm uh, you know, very curious about what the outcome will be. Um, but it was a very well litigated case. And uh, congrats to all of you for really contributing to uh, litigate means to bring to light and hopefully some light will get shed on uh, what 411B means. So thank you. And until the next time, uh, we're going to sign off. So bye all. Thanks so much.